it's the soft skills stuff that breaks businesses more than even the technology or the systems do. Welcome to Your Intended Message, the perfect place for leaders and promising professionals who want to convey the intended message for greater success. Every week, we interview experts who address the challenges and best practices to deliver your message effectively. That might be one-to-one, one-to-few, or one-to-many. And perhaps the most important conversation, one-to-self. I'm your host, George Torok. My guest today is Richard Hagen. Here's three facts that I think you should know about Richard. One. During 20 years as a member and priest in a Catholic religious order, Richard used his preaching, counseling, and facilitation skills to animate communities throughout the UK, South Africa, and even on Long Island. Two, over the last 15 years, he has been running a book online course and transmedia publishing company equipping authors, readers, and students to create powerful transformation. And three, a fantasy Richard would love to come to life to play the role of Inspector Javert in the West End production of Les Miserables, so much for my French studies, just for one night, even just for the one song stars. This I swear by the stars. Richard Hagen, welcome to your intended message. George, thank you for for having me and for indulging, at least on your podcast, a a mini taste of my West End debut. (laughs) (laughs) And perhaps, yes, we might hear a, a line or two from the song before we're done here. Richard, former priest, preacher, Yeah. Now publisher and consultant. I've always marveled at how theatrical a church ceremony can be. It's much more than just a play. There's so many parts and moving pieces. What lessons can you take from there, from being a preacher, to help business leaders improve their communication and especially their presentation skills. What can you take right away? So you, you've hit on something quite profound about that kind of whole religious environment. It is a, it's an environment of rituals, of repeated practices, of physical movement, of chants, of common phrases, common language, common stories and narratives. And that is both incredibly powerful and incredibly constricting. And so as a preacher, one of the challenges is how the heck do you get someone to hear this story, that one of the parables, for example, that they've heard literally a thousand times? How do you get them to hear it? Not just to let it kind of, oh, yeah, I know this one but to hear it perhaps for the first time in a really profound way and be touched by it, be changed by it and go out with your narrative shifted. Because if you've been living in a constricted model and you want to create an empowering vision for somebody else, then you've got to do something that they hear it, that they feel it, they taste it, they, 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 they are inspired and moved by it. And that's the biggest challenge. And I think it's a, it's a big challenge any business leader or any business has. How when we are surrounded by, by the, a world of sameness and a world where in your own business, there are rituals, there are narratives, there are common phrases, oh, we don't do it that way here. Or they said do that, but you know, we, you know we'll just do what we've always done. You know, so these narratives are all operating, these rituals are operating. As a leader, what is it you need to do to disrupt that in a healthy, dynamic way? Not to break it, but to disrupt it. So people hear hear something fresh and they see a vision that is new that they can buy into and move. So for me, that was about doing 
the work. So let's pick a very common parable, the, the parable of the prodigal son, the son who says to his dad, and, you know, I wish you were dead. Give me my inheritance money now. And the dad gives him it and he wanders off and spends all his money on wine, women and song in a foreign land. And then when he's feeding the pigs out of desperation, all his friends have abandoned him. He goes, you know, life was better off back at my dad's. I'll just go back and I'll say, treat me like a slave. Now, everybody who goes to church or Christian community, they've heard that hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. And I knew that we were being fed something quite superficial. It was about kind of forgiveness and generosity with the Father. But actually, most people, when you when you ask them, they're, they're on the side of the older brother who never left home, and they feel it's unfair. This wastrel has come back. And so when I was doing my research, I discovered that the most sh- one of the most shameful things an elderly person could do in that culture, a leader, a chief, the dad in the story, was to show the legs. And here he is running towards the sun, but he's not caring about how other people perceive him or, or anything, disposing himself of all his dignity to embrace that son and make him son again. You would never stop being son. And that's what a leader has to do. They have to, they have to look into the detail of what's going on in their organization. They have to look and see what are the things people that are, are kind of swallowing as beliefs, as narratives, as behavior rituals in their organization. What, what story do I need to tell that is more powerful, that is more captivating, that is perhaps more challenging, but will empower them more. And when you suddenly strip back that in the story of the prodigal son, you go, this is about a father who doesn't give a damn about our principles of fairness or justice. All that father has is love, unconditional love. Now, in in a business context, you know, if only we could have a message of unconditional love in our business context, but in our cold, hard business reality, what is it that you know about your organization, about the future of it and the past, and then how are you going to present that dynamically, powerfully? Because if you just present it in the way it's been presented a thousand other times, there will be no change. So you've got to create a disruptive message. And I remember going out many times with a parish and people saying, I thought I knew what that parable was about. But it was always about the elder son, about the kind of, you know, whatever somebody said up front in their head, they were going, well, me in that story, I'm the older son. It's not fair. And you have to face that, recognize that's there, but then tell a much bigger, much more potent story. And that's exactly the same in the business world. Otherwise, your organization will just keep doing as it's been doing. And we know where that goes in the modern world. Mm. Is that how did that appeal to you, George? That that it's essentially it's crafting a disruptive message and doing the work to do that, that it's deep. And uh, there's no question that if you keep saying everything the same way, people don't hear it anymore. <laughs> it, it it doesn't get noticed. And and so you somehow need to disrupt how it's received or perceived in order to for people to do exactly that, saying, aha, I thought I understood that. But I didn't, but and now I do. Yeah. Well, it's be, be, because as soon as someone starts to speak, most of us are instantly going to our preformed categories, our preformed stories. You go, oh yeah, I know what that's about. And even if you are presenting a disruptive message, if you haven't caught that right at the beginning, they'll never hear it. So you've got to craft the opening words. To put people, I call it going, putting them on the wobble boards. So I, I don't go to the gym, but I see those little half balls that people kind of stand on and balance on to do build up the core strength. You need your audience on a wobble board, not with st- legs of, of stone fixed to the ground. So you've got it right at the beginning, kind of catch them somehow off guard and put them a little bit on the, that wobble board. Then they're going, how, okay, I don't know where I am, help me out. 
and that that that's fundamental to the message of disruption. And it's also it can't just be something provocative. It's got to be deeply thought through, deeply researched. It's got to be rooted in something real, not just. So I, you, your listeners, your podcast viewers will have guessed I'm Scottish, right? So I could be superficially disruptive by showing up today in my my full. Scottish Highland dress with my lovely black jacket, my bow tie, and you, you wouldn't be able to see my kilt because the camera's not quite that big. That's not being disruptive. That's just a little bit of a gimmick. Being disruptive is the impact that you have. And a lot of businesses think that the way they dress, the way they speak, that's what makes them disruptive. No, it's the impact you have that is your disruptive power. If it's not the way they speak, how might a, a business leader start a, a message, a presentation in a way that's disruptive? What kind of techniques might they use? I don't think you can have a, a stronger start than empathy. Mm. And I think this is something when I go to a lot of business conferences and hear business speakers, they're desperate to present their information to tell you their factoids and their what they're about. And actually, one of the most disruptive things that I that that can happen today is that someone explains to you, shows you what is really going on in your context, your situation, that they really get you. you so in uh, your role in business, say it's a business conference, that the business director or speaker or a leader, that they start with your reality, but reveal it to you at a depth that you're going, yeah, well, secretly I knew that, but I didn't think anybody else did. Oh, this person really understands my threats, my challenges, my fears, even my hopes. That actually is about as big a disruptive strategy as a business leader can take because most business leaders are obsessed with their agenda. Now, clearly, structurally, corporately, that's vital, but you're never going to get wholehearted engagement unless you deal with their agenda and tackle that and reveal you have insight and value for them first. That's the starting point. I would get, I would say that that. Structurally, that's the, a really disruptive way of being a leader in business today. Richard, so let's go back to the parable about the, the, the son who went away. So how would you show empathy at the beginning of telling that parable to connect with your audience in a different way? So interesting. that I've never thought about it in that way, but I would go back to, I would probably start with, in this community and the 400, 500 people who are here, you're probably in one of two camps. You are the younger son who feels like they've made a mess of their life and blah, blah, blah. Or, and probably many more of you are the elder son and you're going, I'm always disturbed by this story because I just don't think it's right. And so what you've done in that right at that beginning is you've started with something which no one has articulated before, but which is profoundly felt by each person in either of those audiences and those groups. That and then they're going, oh, he's already touched at a depth. People don't go there. I know I'm interested. Now I want to know more. And that's about them. It's not about you. So what I'm hearing there is is one you're you're demonstrating that you recognize that people might be in different camps with their mindset, yeah, and at the same time you're highlighting the controversy and controversy, of course, is always interesting. It is, and I think I think that the R is in how you move people from those fixed positions, and you then. You don't confirm those bias stories, if you like. As soon as they know you're on their side, then you lead them down a bit of a rabbit hole where you keep them going, I wonder where this is going, I wonder where, you know, and you keep them on that. But you're doing it with great respect. So I was at a conference last week and there was a speaker who was incredibly passionate about his message 
but he was obsessed with the information. He wanted to get the information correct. And he made almost no emotional connection with the entire room. And what emotional connection he did make got quite a few, I don't know if you have this phrase, got people's backs up. Yeah. And because he was obsessed with what he wanted to say and what his message was, what his information was, and he didn't recognize the value of getting that audience, their emotion with him. And then he could have delivered that so much more powerfully. And that that's that fundamental connection between empathy and then your disruptive message. They, they are linked powerfully. And that's a powerful um, point you made there, Richard, because we get fooled into thinking, you know, when we went through the information age, whenever decade that was, we, we got into thinking that information was important, that who knows, the one who knows more is more powerful, you know, knowledge is power. And the reality is that we don't care what you know until we get an idea that you actually care about us. Yeah, and I know that sounds like... It, that would appear to be rocket science for some people, and yeah, but but it's what I, it's, I, it's what I get so frustrated at is is this this phrase soft skills, and it's the toughest skill, it's the hardest set of skills, is that whole interpersonal relational communication space. And I, I kind of feel that that it's the technologists and the machinists and the systemizers who have defined that's the soft skill stuff. No. It's the soft skill stuff that breaks businesses more than even the technology or the systems do. And that that's one of the that's a that's such a yeah, it's such a, a profound thing. People say, oh, our people are our best resources. But we ain't going to invest in our communication team skills. We'll cut everything lean, pile more and more pressure on them. And so we give massively contradictory messages on that, which makes it ever harder then to harness and energize that that brilliant group of people who are there to serve the, the mission of the organization. I'm sorry, I've just gone off on a little bit of a, a tangent there. So Richard, what I what I took from there is, uh, and, and I'm going to I'm going to steal this line from you because <laughs> it's so good. Uh, so, it's soft skills that break business, yeah, or the lack of them. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. It, it, it's it's. I think this is it. So now in my publishing environment, I, I see the same. So I see it in presenting, and I, I coach people on how to present, and and that's every aspect of the business, but. But it is this obsession with information. And as soon as somebody, when they're not doing what they normally do, they reduce all their brilliance to information layer. And, you know, a coach or a consultant, nobody cares what they know to go back to what you said. They care what you can do with and for them. And that is their transformation. To, you know, if information fixed everything, with the advent of Google, the world would be amazingly perfect. If anything, it's got worse in many ways. There are technologically amazing things going on, but on a human relational level, a political cultural level, we seem to be unable to do the evolution that the current situation needs, and that's relational and human. And it's this separation from, of emotion precedes the delivery of information. There's already emotion there anyway. So when you stand up in front of an audience to present the annual report or the vision for the next five years of the business, there is an enormity of emotion in that space. Tackle it, be upfront, be honest, be real about that. And, and bring people together around a collected emotion of aspiration, or it could be driven by fear, whatever it is, but be real about that. And then that emotion allows you to present information to people who are willing and ready to accept it. And then you get them to implement it and take action upon it. But most people just want to go to the information there. That's why so many business presentations, so many business books are deadly dull, because it isn't what that person does. They create transformation and they 
when they present when they sit down to write a book or create a presentation, they deliver data. Mm. And nobody hears it and nobody and fewer people act on it because it never landed, never went inside. Does, I mean, does that resonate with with your own experience, George? Definitely. I, I agree on the power of emotion. And and I'm thinking back to religious communication again, which is which is totally emotion. It's not about it's not about facts or data. And I would think and, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I would think that the two emotions that religion probably taps the most is fear and hope. Yes, I would probably coming from a Catholic background, I'd probably throw guilt. Ooh. In there as well. Now that's per- perhaps a particularly Catholic perspective on this, and I'm being flippant. But I'm being reductive. It's not. It's not just that. But yes. Yeah, so, I mean, even in, in if you look at neurolinguistic programming or or most popular psychology approaches, you have you have that we move towards something or we move away from something. We act based on our fear or on our hope. And most people act more from fear or avoidance of pain than they do towards the attainment of pleasure or hope. And so that's all, that is always an aspect of, of every relationship, of every community, of every office team, of every team out on the road working on projects. These things are in there and in the mix. And I'm intrigued by the cultural differences. I watch quite a lot of um, American kind of YouTube channels and and the whole workplace culture of the the US, as opposed to maybe a more European kind of model and watch these YouTube videos where US people are just shocked by free or low-cost medicals, by holiday allowances, by the expectation that when you have holidays, you take them. You know what is and and the, and the contrast to that work hard work hard work hard culture emotionally you know there's a disadvantages to both but it'd be really interesting to sorry i'm going off on another one but this is this is the reality of the soft skills how do you harness the power of people when they're just working hard all the time or under pressure and being watched or observed or at fear of losing the job if they get sick. It's kind of a really, really interesting space, or, but not quite the publishing world, so I would stop there. <laughs> mm, and yes, and I, and I do recall there were times during my, uh, my career when uh, I was certainly motivated much more by fear than hope. <laughs> the hope, the yeah. hope was, how do I get out of this place? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and the thing, like, Shouldn't a business leader be presenting a vision, something that people w- want to stand behind and move forward? And that that is, that is something that is not just data. It is something which is profoundly personal for everyone in that organisation. It makes a difference for them and the people they care for or the culture or the the country that you live in through your products and services. This is such a massive generational shift now that this whole sense of purpose-driven organization that that's not just profit, it profit business doesn't exist without it. But people, the younger generations are wanting more and and rightly so that they're they're going in the current situation we live in. We have to be contributing more than just profit. Who am I? Why am I here? And if you can harness that for the vision of your organization, you're in a different league compared to those who are time sheeting and manipulating and controlling. It's a very different, different space. And uh, again, I, I see another relationship there between uh, business today and religion. And and you point out that the importance, the power of vision. Well, of course, religion is all about vision. And of course, religion is is the answer to the big question we have. Why are we here? Why are we here? And that's a question that more businesses need to ask of themselves. And it's funny that it just took uh, humanity, uh, what, three, four thousand years or so to figure out with Simon Sinek saying that, you know, the big question is why? Well, yeah, 
Wait, the and religion's he's, he's, not, he's, not, he's not the first, but he's done a fabulous job of branding. The, the, you know, I wish I could brand like he did. I mean, obviously, the, the kind of elephant in the room with my context is that normally if someone's a member of a Catholic religious order or a priest, that's a lifetime thing. And that's literally, I prostrated myself in front of 1,200 people in my home parish, committed myself to life for this. And obviously, I'm not doing that anymore. So something happened, and I won't go into the the mess of it or the pain of it, but that organisation that I committed to for life, with the work that I did, and I was so privileged. People allowed me access to their lives in such intimate, powerful ways, and I never, I, I just enormously grateful for that. But the organisation and its control mechanisms and the corruption and the power that goes along with that kind of broke me in the end. And I couldn't function in that helping role. So that's when I moved out, became a teacher, and now run my publishing company because the order I was in ran a publishing company that I I learned my craft in that, that environment. But and it's like now it's right, everything I've ever done and all the roles I've done is the same mission I've always had, which is to create transformation and nurture and empowerment. But without the st- dogma and the controlling structures and and i think most big organizations face similar challenges now these smaller businesses are so lean so agile so fast you either swallow them up by buying them out and strip them of their power and their value at the same time or you learn to adapt the whole of your culture and philosophy to do that in similar ways I mean, who knows where these big monoliths will be in 10, 20 years' time. There might just be one. Mm. And everybody else is doing their own thing. Who knows? But it, it will not be the same as it is at the moment. And unless corporate leaders wake up to this profound shift in how the younger generations operate and think and want to behave in a working life, then... They're not going. They're the dinosaurs that will that will go extinct. Mm. Richard, you learned you learned about publishing while you were a, a member of of the priesthood, yes. and and you've taken that skill set and you've now created that as part of your business. Who do you help with your publishing, and and what do you do for them? So, those who want to, they've got expertise. They get great results for their clients when they work with them, and that might be one-to-one or in small groups, or they might be presenters, or it might be a business that that deliver, helps people create results through a lot of interaction and effort at that stage. And essentially, anyone who's in that position, who's got a stable business, they've got this expertise and experience behind them and is hungry to reach a bigger audience to have a bigger impact at scale and to make a bigger difference to the world. Those are the people we work with. We, we've we started to, to work with organizations that are like charity here in the UK, charities that have a very specific purpose. And we do exactly the same with them as we do with a business, which is, first of all, to really craft their message. What is their unique intellectual property? their unique system, their unique approach, their unique message. And to be honest, most corporate leaders or business leaders or business owners have a mishmash of an accumulation of bits and bobs over the years. And it's all kind of a bit jangled up together. And my partner in the business particularly helps kind of deconstruct that and go, right, and your system, your message, let's pull that out, let's highlight that, let's present that, because that in and of itself is disruptive. When everybody else is using the disk profiling system or Myers-Briggs, and you have your own, and it is researched and tested, that is profoundly valuable for your business and your brand, and people who it's designed for will will experience it like magic. So so it's those people who, who... get great results. They might not necessarily be the best marketers in the world, and they might watch companies that have great marketing but can't deliver the results, steal or break the market. And so that's part of that away from. People are going like, those people are going there and they're going to be disappointed. And so that's a really good motivation, but they've also got to have that. And I'm going to create better results, much stronger results at scale. So... Yeah, so anyone really 
who wants to to go to scale up their impacts and their income, their influence, and I suppose have that do it with purpose, great value. Mm-hmm. And uh, you can find uh, more information about uh, Richard and his publishing at HagenDoes.com. And you can find that link in the description below. Richard, as we prepare to wrap up, if you could give advice to a business leader who's about to speak at a company meeting, and if you could give them one, two or three pieces of advice on how they can speak without being perceived as it being a sermon. <laughs> right. So, well, I think you'd have to do your research into that audience. Before you speak to them, know who they are. And I don't mean just superficially or by the roles in the business. Know what their threats and challenges, fears and hopes are. That's your starting point. Tackle that at the beginning, but you've got to do work before you show up on that. And that is work you have to do. You cannot hold hand that off to anybody else to do your research because that will not allow you to create that emotional connection. It has to be somehow you do that research, that discovery work, and that that dictates how you present. You will have your own agenda. But in some ways, it, that's irrelevant until you deal with theirs. So that would be the first way. Just do your research on the emotionality and the hopes and aspirations of that audience and be real about that. So that would be the first one to start with. Mm. Practical and powerful advice. My guest today is Richard Hagen, reminding you that sometimes you need to put people on the wobble board. If you like what you heard, tell your friends and post your five-star review on Apple Podcasts because that helps more listeners find us. Come back every week for more practical insights to help you deliver your intended message. I'm your host, George Torok. 